So, brothers and sisters, it's that time of year again. It's come round again where evil is being celebrated and even being aimed at our children as well because it's something that they want children to do, isn't it? Go out there celebrating evil. It's that time of year again. So, I want to look at how this kind of this demonic celebration, this celebration of evil, how it came into Western culture. Now, this, this holiday, as it's called, it's called a holiday, isn't it? It's known, of course, as Halloween today. However, you can trace it back all the way to Celtic times. So we're talking like 2,000 years ago in what would be now Great Britain and northern France and places like this. So you can trace it back to the ancient, fest the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain, of Samhain. That's the origin of what is now called Halloween. Now, Samhain was effectively the Celtic New Year, which was the 1st of November. The 1st of November was considered to be the Celtic New Year. It was also the first day of winter as well, when things got really dark and gloomy, especially in the Celtic world. And, of course, the night before this would have been considered to be like New Year's Eve. It was the night before New Year's Day. And it was during this time that, that the ancient Celtics believed that the, the veil that separates life and death, the living and the dead, the veil that separates the two is that it's thinnest during this time because it's all dark and, and the winter has now come. And the, so they believed that, that the veil between life and death was at its thinnest. And they believed that during this time, this is when ghosts and spirits would manifest themselves. So some of the traditions that we see today in Halloween are traced back all the way to this festival. Basically, they would also sacrifice animals as well. They would wear the animal skins as costumes and they would light bonfires to ward off these ghosts, these evil spirits. This is what they used to do in ancient Celtic times. And then around the 8th century, so much later, it then turned into somewhat of a religious holiday known as All Saints Day. All Saints Day was the 1st of November instituted by the Catholic Church. And again, the Catholics love worshipping and praying to saints, don't they? So the 1st of November was known as All Saints Day. And the 31st of October, the night before, was called All Hallows' Eve. All's, All Hallows' Eve was the name for that night before All Saints' Day. And of course, it incorporated some of these traditions and practices that go all the way back to the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain. The wearing of costumes and the lighting of fires and things like this. All these paganized elements made their way into what was supposed to be a religious holiday. Now that is very similar to what we see today in the Western world in that a lot of the Western culture and the Western church does have elements of paganism mixed in with it. And it's something that we know that God detests. God detests a mixture, especially when it comes to the holy things mixed with the unholy things, the things of paganism. And this is what we see quite a lot today in the Western church is that there is a lot of pagan elements in it, especially some of these holidays. Now, around the 19th century, this is when it became more popularized in America, because Halloween is very much American, isn't it? And it became popularized in America around the 19th century, mainly because of all the European immigrants who came over to America. But it kept all those pagan traditions, all those pagan practices that were associated originally with the Celtic festival of Samhain, and then, of course, with All Hallows' Eve. Those practices kind of remained and kind of evolved and then morphed into this what you'd call now a celebration of evil that is what Halloween's all about it's all about celebrating the demonic that's why we see people going out dressed up like demons and zombies and witches and stuff like this but unfortunately it's children isn't it and this is why the devil is at work aiming at the children because the children are the future generation the, gen the, the devil wants to corrupt the future generation and therefore this is why we have children in two nights time going out dressed up like demons, celebrating what is effectively a demonic celebration, all these pagan elements. Now, of course, Halloween in America is now the second biggest holiday of the year. There's $6 billion a year in America spent on Halloween. It is effectively second to Christmas. Christmas is the most celebrated and most spent holiday. But Halloween is number two. $6 billion a year in America is spent on Halloween to dress up like the dead. Now, of course, some of these people profess to be Christians. There are people who actually call themselves Christians and raising their children as Christians who would also then go out once a year 
on the 31st of October dressed up like zombies and demons and witches and things like this, celebrating evil, giving, giving a, the devil a foothold in their life. This is what they do when they go out and celebrate these things. The children are exposed to the evil, aren't they? Now, you've all heard of Anton LaVey, I assume. He's the founder of the Satanic Church. And this is a quote from him. This is what he said. I am glad that Christian parents let their children worship the devil at least one night out of the year. And that night, of course, is Halloween. And that's from the founder of the Satanic Church himself. Children are out there worshipping the devil and not even knowing it. One night a year. It's one night too many, isn't it? Now, it's interesting that in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 as well, you have seven letters to seven churches. I'm sure you're all familiar with those letters. They were seven letters to seven literal churches that existed in the first century. But also what we see is we see that those seven churches, they represent seven different stages throughout church history. And there's a number of things you can go into about this. There's a number of parallels you can draw with the seven letters in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 and the way church history has progressed throughout the last 2,000 years. You can draw up so many parallels. We'd be here all night if we were to go into them all. However, the last church, the one that we're in now, the one that was basically from the 1900s onwards, you could say, is the church of Laodicea, known as the lukewarm church. Laodicea is the lukewarm church, and it corresponds to the church age that we're in today. Now, what is lukewarm? Lukewarm water is basically a mixture of hot and cold, isn't it? You can't spit out the cold water without the hot. You have to spit out the whole lot. And that is why Jesus said, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth, because you can't spit out the cold water without the hot. And this is another reason why God hates a mixture. Remember, the church of Laodicea corresponds to the church age that we're in now, where there was a mixture which made lukewarm what do we see now? A mixture. We see a mixture of paganism and Western Christianity. It's all mixed in together. And as I've said, God hates a mixture. There's always these typological laws you can look into in the Bible where God does not like things mixed. You can go into Deuteronomy and things like this, and there's all these kind of laws where God hates a mixture. He hates things being mixed. We see, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 14, it says, For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? God hates a mixture. Now this term Belial is a very interesting word, this Belial. You only see it in, the, in 2 Corinthians 6 in the New Testament. Belial is basically a Hebrew word, and it's now a word used for the devil. It's kind of like Beelzebub, or the words that you see that are associated with the devil. Belial is a demonic term. Now it's a Hebrew word. And what it means is, it means worthlessness. Beli is without, and yal is value or worth. So it means without worth or worthless. And what that basically means is, it means wicked to the point of worthlessness. It means beyond wicked. There's a Hebrew word for wicked, which is ra, ra. Whenever you see ra, ra, that means wicked or evil. But Belial goes a step further. It means basically wicked to the point of worthlessness. The other place you see in the scripture this word, Belial, is in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Remember Eli the priest? He had two corrupt sons, didn't he? Two corrupt sons, they were called Hophni and Phinehas, not to be confused with the Phinehas from the book of Numbers, he was righteous. But Hophni and Phinehas were the corrupt sons of Eli, and in second, sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, they were called Beli, Belial, sons of Belial. In other words, they were worthless. They were so wicked, they were called Belial. And like I say, Belial is now associated with the devil. It is a demonic term. Why? Because Christ does not like a mixture. He does not like light being mixed with darkness. He does not like righteousness being mixed with unrighteousness. He does not like a believer being mixed with an unbeliever in an ungodly way. God hates a mixture. And that's what we see today. We see a mixture of paganism in the Western world and even in the Western church. And that's why Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. The reason that there's so-called Christians who are going out once a year having fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness the reason that there's so-called Christians mixing paganism and Western culture is because there's actually a very sinister spirit behind all of this. 
There is a very, very sinister spirit working behind all of this. Please turn to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Now, before we go into 1 John chapter 4, I want us to actually go back one verse into the last verse of chapter 3, because the chapter divisions that we have in our Bibles were actually not part of the original canon. The original Hebrew and Greek canons did not have the chapter divisions. They were added much later. And some of these chapter divisions can be quite inconveniently placed. They can kind of interrupt a thought, you could say. So when you want to study a chapter, it's sometimes a good idea to just look back at the previous chapter, the last couple of verses, because that thought can carry on into the next chapter. As I said, the chapter divisions weren't originally part of the, the original Greek canon. They were added much later. So in 1 John chapter 3, verse 24, we'll just go from 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. It says this, Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. So he who keeps the commandments of Christ abides in Christ, and Christ abides in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So that is how we know how we abide with Christ. It is by the Spirit that he has given us. That is the Holy Spirit, of course, that lives in everyone who is born again. Then in 1 John chapter 4, in verse 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. You see the connection there. It's talking about the spirit that he has given us. But then in 1 John chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, it goes on to say, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. How do we test the spirits, brothers and sisters? We test it against the word of God, don't we? We line everything up against the Bible, the word of God. That is how we test the spirits. If something is not in line with the Bible, it is not from God. It's from another spirit. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know that the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is now already in the world. Now, we hear a lot of terms, all these spirits, don't we? We hear spirit of this, spirit of that, and a lot of them aren't actually biblical. We often hear, you know, you've got the spirit of this or the spirit of that. But a lot of the time, it doesn't actually come from the Bible. But there is a term here that is 100% scriptural, and that is the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist. So the Bible describes a literal Antichrist who is going to come, a literal man who is going to be the Antichrist, is going to come and reign for three and a half years in the last days before the return of Christ. But it also describes the Antichrist as a spirit that's already at work, a spirit that is already at work in the world. So it's not just a literal man, it is going to be a literal man who's going to come and reign for three and a half years, but it's also a spirit that's at work in the world. The spirit of Antichrist is basically preparing the world for the coming of the Antichrist. Now, if you go back to 1 John chapter 2, let us go back to 1 John chapter 2, just two chapters back. We see the term Antichrist used again. 1 John chapter 2 from verse 18. 1 John chapter 2 verse 18. It says, little children, it is the last hour, as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. So that's talking about the literal Antichrist, the man who will reign for three and a half years before the return of Christ. The Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have already come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. That means that those who did not stay with us, they never were of us to begin with. He's talking, of course, about people like Judas, isn't it? This is John writing here, one of the disciples, who would have seen Judas' betrayal against Jesus. Verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And that no lies of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. 
Do you hear that? Whoever denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So it's talking here not just about the Antichrist, but many Antichrists who have already come. There are many Antichrists. Now if we go forward into the next epistle, which is 2 John, in John's second epistle, this is actually the shortest book in the Bible. 2 John is the shortest book in the entire Bible. In 2 John, verse 7, there's only one chapter, 2 John, verse 7, it says, for, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So there we go. We see more antichrists that John is speaking about here. It's interesting that John writes a lot about antichrists, plural. He writes about the antichrist, but he also writes about many antichrists and also the spirit of antichrist. So the many antichrists who have already come, they're all led by the spirit of antichrist. That's why they're called antichrists, because they're led by the spirit of antichrist. And each one of them all foreshadow the last one. This is how Hebrew prophecy works. Every type of antichrist that you see in the Bible foreshadows the last one, the antichrist, the final one who's coming. So when you see all the, the wicked, evil men in the Bible, like Nebuchadnezzar or Pharaoh or Herod, or Haman, or Judas. Judas is one of the most major types. All of these wicked men foreshadow the Antichrist, just like all the good men foreshadow Christ. Joshua, David, Moses, they all foreshadow Christ in some way. Well, all the wicked men in the Bible foreshadow the Antichrist. That's how it all works with the typology that we see in Scripture. And it says that those who foreshadow the Antichrist, they are deceivers. He's a deceiver and an antichrist, it said in 2 John. And they're also persecutors as well, aren't they? Nebuchadnezzar and Pharaoh and Herod, they're all persecutors. So anyone who is a deceiver or a persecutor is an antichrist, an antichrist. They foreshadow the antichrist in some way. And it says that many deceivers and false prophets have gone out into the world. And that's how we know that the spirit of antichrist is at work among us right now because... We're living in an age now where we see more and more false prophets and false teachers being raised up. It's unprecedented. We see so many false teachers and false prophets all being raised up and all being led by the spirit of Antichrist. That's why we see also a rise in persecution and anti-Semitism. Look at the anti-Semitism we are seeing at the moment on our streets in our own country. We're seeing anti-Semitism rise every single day now. And it's all from the spirit of Antichrist. Why? Because the Antichrist is the ultimate deceiver and the ultimate anti-Semite. That is what the Antichrist is. He's a deceiver and an anti-Semite. And that is why we are seeing a rise in these things. Why? Because the spirit of Antichrist is at work behind the scenes. And of course, the outcome of the work of the spirit of Antichrist is, is that the world is now becoming a very dark place and a very hostile place for the child of God to be in. If you're a child of God, if you're a born-again saint, you're living in a very hostile environment, an environment where the saint, the child of God, is not wanted. The message of Jesus Christ is not wanted. That's why we're seeing persecution against the body of Christ and against Israel as well. The world is becoming increasingly hostile against the message of Jesus Christ. We see jihadists now chanting jihad on our streets, don't we? We see them celebrating evil. We see them celebrating anti-Semitism. But if you go out and say that homosexuality is a sin, the police are going to be all over you. They'll stand back and do nothing whilst people chant jihad and gas the Jews and death to Israel. The police will stand back and do nothing and let them get away with that. You open your mouth about homosexuality, they're all over you. And then you're going to be in jail, aren't you? Why? Because the spirit of Antichrist is at work. That's why these things happen. That's why we see the police on the side of evil and not standing up for what's right. Now, I'm not saying every copper is like that. I'm sure there's some good coppers. But the Metropolitan Police in general is a society of cowards. They are cowards who cannot even bring themselves to stand up against the tyranny that is Islam. And it's because of what? The spirit of Antichrist which is at work. We see perversion and all, and all kinds of other evil being celebrated. 
And again, if you speak up against it, then you're the one in trouble. If you go to a gay pride parade and see all these sodomites walking around in high heels and performing or simulating sexual acts on each other in front of children as well, they, they drag five-year-old children to this stuff. But then if you open your mouth and quote Leviticus 18 or Romans chapter 1, who are the police going to go after? Not the perverts who are walking around half naked. They're going to go after the Christian who are speaking the word of God. Why? Because it's the spirit of Antichrist at work in the world. And children are being taught this stuff as well. Children are in schools being taught that it's okay for a man to marry a man. Children are in schools being taught it's okay for a man to become a woman or for, for a woman to uh, become a man. Children are being taught this stuff and they're being taught that it's good. And again, the children who are being brought up in Christian homes who actually dare to open their mouths, they're getting suspended and expelled, aren't they? Because their views are not acceptable anymore. We're living in the age that Isaiah spoke about in chapter 5 in verse 20. Woe to those who call good evil and evil good. It's the exact age we're living in now where we call good evil and evil good. It's evil to murder your own baby in, in your own womb. But the world calls it good. The world calls it health care. The world calls it women's rights. It's evil to take a young child to a sodomite parade to see grown men simulating sexual acts on each other, but the world calls it good. The world calls it tolerant and in the name of diversity. We'll look at where the so-called name of diversity has got us. We've got jihadists on our streets now chanting jihad in the name of diversity. And it's all from the spirit of Antichrist. Now, Revelation 13 tells us, Revelation 13 tells us that the world is going to be forced to submit to the Antichrist. Remember, there is a literal Antichrist coming. A man who is the Antichrist will come, and he's going to demand the whole world to submit to him. And of course, that can't happen overnight. The world needs to be conditioned. The world needs to be softened up. And how does Satan do that? By the spirit of Antichrist at work. And we see in Revelation 13 and verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or their foreheads, and that no, no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is a number of a man. His number is 666. Now it tells us that many are going to receive this mark and submit to the Antichrist. Many are going to receive this mark and pledge their allegiance to the Antichrist. But that can't just happen overnight. The world needs to be softened up. Now, we've seen precursors to what's coming. We've seen this mark of the beast being foreshadowed by many things. And not just in recent times. It's been going on for quite a while. Think about it. You can't function in society now without a bank account. If you don't have a bank account, you can't function in society. Social security numbers, national insurance numbers, everyone has to have them. I'm not saying you'll go to hell if you have a bank account. I'm not saying you'll go to hell if you have a social security number, but it's all things that only came about in the last hundred years that people cannot function in society without. And therefore, it's just gradually conditioning the world to get used to mandatory this, mandatory that, so that when the real thing comes, it won't be a shock. That's what the devil's doing. That's what the spirit of Antichrist is doing right now, conditioning and preparing the world for the real thing by all these subtle little things. We will have to have passports to travel, don't we? Not everyone might have a passport, but you can't leave the country without one. And that's only in the last couple of hundred, sorry, um, last hundred years. Only about the 1920s is when they started bringing in what we today call passports. And again, it's all things just to gradually condition and soften the world up. Now, we've seen, obviously, some major foreshadowings in the last three years of what the Bible speaks about here in Revelation 13. We've seen some real foreshadowings of this. Things that really, really line up with what the Bible says. No man can buy or sell without this mark. People have already been told that they can't work and provide for their families unless they comply with what the government want. We've already seen this in the last three years. Where's it all leading? It's all leading to this, Revelation 13. It's all leading to the last one. And how does the devil do it? He softens the world up by the spirit of Antichrist, which is at work. Now, right now, we have some respite. It has kind of gone away. And when I was in Toronto, Canada, a few months ago, I gave a sermon over there about labor pains and about how the labor pains, the contractions, 
are likened to the last days, in that the tribulation gets worse and worse, but then there's respite. Those contractions come, don't they, ladies? And then you get some respite, but then they come back again, and they come back stronger. That's exactly how the tribulation works. And right now, we're in a period of respite. You know, what we've seen in the last three years has kind of gone away a bit. But something else will come back. If it's not the same thing, something else will come back. They're talking about the green agenda, aren't they? All this green agenda. You can't even drive a car in London now without paying twelve fifty a day. And it's going to get worse. That's just the beginning. They're going to start coming into your homes and making sure that your boiler is compliant. And if not, you're going to get fined. They're going to start really putting pressure on you to comply with this net zero garbage. And if you don't comply with it, you're going to be basically cast out. You're going to be unable to function in society. These things are coming. Social credit scores. How well are you complying with the government? If you're not complying, they're going to make your life difficult. They're going to switch your power off. Or they're going to make you pay more money for certain goods. Things like this. This is all coming. Digital IDs, all this kind of thing. It's all in the pipeline already. So we are in a period of respite. But don't get too comfortable because something will come back. We are going to be put under pressure once again. And it's interesting because the word tribulation in the Bible, in, in, in Greek, philipsis, it means literally constriction. That's what the Greek word for tribulation literally means, constriction. We're going to be under constriction by the enemy. Now, one thing we do know about this mark, we don't know what it is, but we do know one thing about this mark, and that's whoever takes it is sealed to eternal destruction. Whenever someone takes this mark, not the precursors, of course, although the precursors do foreshadow the last one, but whoever takes the final mark here, described in Revelation 13, is sealed to a destruction. It literally seals their fate, their doom. And it tells us in Revelation 14, in the next chapter, that there's no coming back from that destruction. Revelation 14, verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. He worships the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Does that sound like you can come back once you've taken the mark? Does that sound like you can come back from hell once you're there? Of course it doesn't. But in verse 12, we see this. Here is the perseverance of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's talking about the faithful remnant in the last days who will refuse this mark. The ones who will stand firm and not give their soul to the devil. Hallelujah. That's talking about the faithful remnant. Praise the Lord. Now, something else we're told in Scripture is that many of those who will submit to the Antichrist and, and seal their doom ultimately are some of those who profess to be Christians. This is one of the things that we're warned about in the Scriptures is that so many of these who will submit to the Antichrist and take the mark are professing Christians, people who profess to be born again, people who profess to have a relationship with Jesus. And this is what the Bible means by the great apostasy. We see this term, the great apostasy, or the great falling away, is apostasia in Greek. The great apostasy is talking about this. It's talking about the final one, when so many so-called Christians will turn from the true faith and put their allegiance to the Antichrist. Now again, that can't just take place overnight. The devil can't get millions of so-called Christians to just turn away from the faith and then submit to the Antichrist. No, there has to be some groundwork laid. There has to be preparation work done. That's exactly what the devil is doing now. The spirit of Antichrist is preparing not just the world, but also the apostate church to submit to the Antichrist. And that's why we see unprecedented apostasy in our churches today. We are seeing now churches who were once good, churches who were once biblically sound, completely turning away from the Holy Scriptures. It's unprecedented. We've never seen so many biblically sound churches now in a complete mess and now on the devil's payroll instead of God's. It's now the church who Satan is attacking. And how does he do that? He raises up false teachers and deceivers, as we've already said. More and more false teachers we are seeing being raised up 
and led by the spirit of Antichrist. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. There are so many warnings in the Bible against false teachers. Paul gives Timothy one here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I like this term imposters because I think that describes exactly what a false Christian is. A false Christian is an imposter. Someone who's made their way into the church, made their way onto the scene, but they're not who they say they are. That's what an imposter is. An imposter is, if I was to ring up someone, uh, a credit card company, and pretend to be someone else to commit fraud, I'm an imposter. I'm impersonating someone. So an imposter is someone who pretends to be someone they're not. And that's exactly what we have in the church. The term Paul uses here is an imposter, someone who is not a Christian but professes to be. They will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So they deceive themselves and then they go and deceive others. The reason they deceive other people is because they are themselves deceived. And they probably got deceived by another deceiver. So the deception passes through like this, like a, like a domino effect. People are deceived and then they go and deceive other people. How many times do you get YouTube clips and stuff like this sent to you from someone saying, oh look, look at what it says here. And it's complete nonsense. They haven't even tested it against scripture. These loose cannons who've got nothing better to do than to spend time on social media. They just send people clip after clip. And then these people don't have the discernment to actually say, is that scriptural? They just go and believe it. And that's why we are seeing deception unprecedented and apostasy unprecedented. Now, we'd be here all night if I was to go through all the deceivers who are out there ready to deceive you. But I'm going to name one, and that's Rob Bell. That guy is dangerous. So many Christians, or false Christians they are indeed, have turned away from scriptural doctrine because of something they've heard from Rob Bell. Rob Bell is uh, he, he's, um, to do with the emergent church. I'm sure you've all heard of the emergent church. He has deceived so many people into turning away from scriptural doctrine to what the Bible calls doctrines of demons. So watch out for Rob Bell. That guy is dangerous. He's a deceiver. He has called so many Christians to fall away. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. These guys are not ministers of God. They are ministers of Satan. His ministers transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. These guys are not on God's payroll. They're on the devil's payroll. They are working for the devil and they are being led by the spirit of Antichrist. There's a guy called Vance Havner, famous theologian, Vance Havner. A quote from him which says, Satan is not fighting churches, he's joining them. You hear that? Satan is not fighting churches, he's joining them. We have churches now where Satan himself is speaking from the pulpit. Because the spirit of Antichrist is raising up these deceivers to deceive the people of God. And it's because we have people speaking by the spirit of Antichrist and not by the Holy Spirit that we have so many churches that are now apostate. We've seen unprecedented apostasy taking place in the Western church. The Church of England are now blessing same-sex marriage. Something which was unthinkable only 30 years ago. I grew up in the Church of England. 30 years ago this was unthinkable. And now the Church of England are blessing same-sex marriage. They're ordaining transvestite priests. Again, something which was completely unthinkable only 30 years ago. What's it going to be like in another 30 years? That's 30 years we've seen. What's it going to be like in another 30? I dread to think. Now, churches used to be places where you can come and hear the gospel. You can come and get saved. You can come and get discipled and fed. That's what churches used to be about. What are they now? Churches are just are now places where you can go and get entertained and comforted in your sin. That's what churches are now. They just comfort people in their sin. Tell people God loves them. doesn't matter who you are. God loves you. Yeah, God does love you, but he hates your sin. And it's your sin that's separating you from him. Hallelujah. So 
So Charles Spurgeon said, the time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, we will have clowns entertaining the goats. And how right he was. We don't have shepherds feeding the sheep anymore. We have clowns entertaining the goats. We don't have worship anymore. We have entertainment. It's all entertainment now, isn't it? The worship that we see now is not worship. It's entertainment. We don't have preachers anymore. We don't have Bible expositors anymore. We have motivational speakers. You go to Joel Osteen's church or you go to Kenneth Copeland's church, you'll hear a motivational message, a motivational speaker. That's all you'll get. You won't get the pure food of the word of God. You won't get the pure grain of the word of God. You'll get the chaff, which I've already said is worthless, isn't it? It's worthless. That's what you get in churches these days. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but because they have itching ears, they will heap for themselves teachers to suit their own desires. Now, the reason these false teachers have such massive followings is because of the gullible people who follow them. I blame the people who follow them. The people who follow them are the ones who are keeping these people going. The people who follow them and donating their money to them are the reason they're still in ministry. These wolves would have been out of ministry a long time ago if people would have seen them for who they are. But no, because people are deceived, because people haven't got eyes to see, because people have no oil in their lamps, they support these false prophets. And it's because of these gullible people that these false prophets and false teachers are even still in ministry. It is because of them. Because they want to be comforted in their sin. They want to be told that God wants to make them rich and to give them a wonderful life. The Bible says that we are going to suffer tribulation for our faith in Jesus Christ. You can either believe the Bible or you can believe these false teachers. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now this apostasy that we're seeing now, the gradual apostasy that we're seeing is all spoken of again in, in 1 Timothy. Paul warned Timothy a lot about this kind of thing. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 1, it says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us, Clearly that in the last days, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and doctrines of demons. I used that term already, didn't I? Doctrines of demons. It's not a Stephen Clayton term. It's a Jesus Christ term. This is the word of God, not the word of Stephen Clayton. Doctrines of demons. Whenever someone is following a doctrine that is not the doctrine of Jesus Christ, it is a doctrine of demons. It is from the spirit of Antichrist. Matthew also said in, 20, in uh, chapter 22, sorry, 24, verse 10, that many will fall away and betray one another. Jesus warned us about that, that many will fall away and betray one another. So all this apostasy that we're seeing, all the apostasy described here in the Bible, it's all leading up to the great apostasy, what I just said, the great apostasy. There is a great apostasy coming, a great falling away. Please turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because that's where we see this term. Not the apostasy that we're seeing now, but the final apostasy. And that is when we're going to see not just the spirit of Antichrist, but the Antichrist emerge on the scene. Again, it's all foreshadowing the Antichrist, the final one. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you were still in 1 John, you haven't got that far back, just a couple of books 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 1. Again, this is what the spirit of Antichrist is preparing the world for. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that's our resurrection, rapture, whatever you want to call it, our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The word there in the Greek is the apostasia, so it's talking about the falling away, the apostasy. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. So that's the man of lawlessness there, the Antichrist. In Greek it's anthropon enomon, it means man of lawlessness is revealed. The son of perdition. Who else was called the son of perdition? Judas was also called the son of perdition. Why? Because he's a type of the Antichrist, isn't he? He foreshadows the Antichrist. The man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, who opposes and exhorts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits in, as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
He's going to sit in the temple and declare himself to be God, this Antichrist is. Verse 5, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you all these things, and now you know what is restraining. So something is restraining this Antichrist, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Again, spirit of Antichrist is at work already, isn't it? Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So we see there's another spirit there at work, restraining this spirit of Antichrist. And that, of course, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is restraining this spirit of Antichrist. But it tells us that this Holy Spirit restraining is going to be removed. The Holy Spirit eventually is going to be removed and not restrained anymore. Now, don't misunderstand me. The Holy Spirit will not be taken from our hearts because Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. The Holy Spirit will not be taken from our hearts, but the Holy Spirit will be taken from the world in terms of convicting the world of sin and empowering the church to preach the gospel. So the Holy Spirit will no longer function in that way when it's removed and stops restraining. However, the Holy Spirit remains in our hearts. Verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So as soon as this restrainer, the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the way, the lawless one will be revealed. That is what will then unleash this evil full strength in the person of Antichrist, the outcome's already been told to us straight away. The Lord will consume him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him with the brightness of his coming. We will have been told what the outcome is here. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So those who perish, why did they perish? They perished because they did not receive the love of the truth. And that's something we all have to ask ourselves, how much do you love the truth? Because you can know the truth, you can even believe the truth, but you have to love the truth. Let me tell you, demons know the truth, demons even believe the truth, because it says in James 2.19, even demons believe and tremble. When Jesus was casting out demons from people, they said, you are the son of God. Have you come to torment us before our time? Demons know the truth and they believe the truth. What's the difference though? Demons don't love the truth. There are people out there who know the truth and there are people out there who probably even believe the truth. But that's not enough. Do they love the truth? Do you love the truth? How much do you love the truth? Because there are people out there who know the truth and believe the truth, but they don't love the truth. And they know that they're going to be destroyed through it. They don't want to be saved. Why? Because they want to remain in darkness, don't they? So knowing the truth is not enough. Believing the truth is not even enough. You have to love the truth. Because even demons, even demons believe and tremble. Even demons know the truth. Verse 11. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. Who sends them strong delusion there? God sends them strong delusion. Not Satan. It's God who sends the, del the delusion upon these people who do not receive the love of the truth and so be saved. It's God who blinds them. It's God who hands them over. Why? Because they have made their choice. They have made their decision to remain in darkness and to remain blind. And therefore, God sends them delusion so that they submit to the Antichrist. God sends them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Another reason why people will not come to the truth, it is because they have pleasure in unrighteousness. That's why people don't believe. It's because they want to hold on to their sin. It's because they want to live a life of unrighteousness and God's holy laws and God's only way of salvation interrupts their life of sin. That's why they don't want to come to the truth. They want to be free to carry out their sinful desires. They want to be free to carry out whatever they want to do, whatever makes them happy. That's what they get told, isn't it? People get told, do what you want, do what makes you happy. Well, when they get told the opposite, actually, there's a holy, righteous God who you're going to stand before one day, and if you don't submit to him, you're going to perish in hell. Well, people don't want to hear that, do they? They want to hear the other side. They want to hear all the comforting stuff, don't they? That's why people won't believe. There's a bishop by the name of uh, Fulton Sheen who said that atheism is not the knowledge that God doesn't exist, it is the wish that he doesn't exist so that one can sin without reproach. People 
do not know that God doesn't exist. They wish that he doesn't exist so they can sin without reproach, so they can enjoy their sin. They don't want to be told that what they're doing is wrong. They don't want to be told that what they're doing is leading them to hell. They just want to live in darkness and enjoy their sin without being interrupted. That's why people will not believe, because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. And of course, what is driving all that? What is the spirit behind all that? It is the spirit of Antichrist, the same spirit that is driving everybody away from God to the devil. It is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, as I said, there is this other spirit at work, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is at work in us, conforming us, sanctifying us, and making us more like Jesus Christ every day of our lives. That is the spirit that is at work in us. Hallelujah. The spirit of Antichrist is at work in the world, preparing the world and the apostate church for the coming of the Antichrist. The Holy Spirit is at work in us, preparing us for the coming of the Christ. Hallelujah. So right now, the Holy Spirit is restraining. The Holy Spirit is restraining what is behind these demonic things. The Holy Spirit is restraining, but the Holy Spirit will not be restraining forever. It will be taken and it will cease restraining. Then that's when the evil will be unleashed, the three and a half year reign of Antichrist. And basically anyone who submits to the Antichrist and takes the mark as we've seen has sealed their fate. They are doomed to destruction. Now, Again, the reason that's going to happen is because of the groundwork that's being prepared. And we see the two spirits there. Everyone follows one of those two spirits. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from. Everyone follows one of those two spirits. But you can't follow both. You cannot follow both. You have to follow one of them. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot drink, sorry, you cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Everyone follows a Christ, the Antichrist or the Christ, but you can't follow both. Everyone follows a spirit, the Holy Spirit or the spirit of Antichrist, but you can't follow both. You can't drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. And in a couple of nights' time, there's going to be people out there drinking from the cup of demons, eating at the table of demons, and some of which have the audacity to call themselves Christians. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and the table of demons at the same time. And of course, it didn't just happen overnight. This is what the spirit of Antichrist has been doing for centuries, laying the groundwork, the preparation work. And that's why you can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. That's why you can't eat at the Lord's table and the table of demons. And that is why you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve Jesus Christ and the devil at the same time. You have to choose. And that's why I'm going to finish with a famous verse, which is often shared this time of year at Halloween, Joshua 24, 15. Choose this day who you're going to serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. We will serve the Lord. We will serve Jesus Christ because anyone who serves Jesus Christ is going to spend eternity with him in his kingdom. Or anyone who serves the devil is going to spend eternity with him in his kingdom. And it can't be simpler than that, can it? That's why the gospel is so simple that even a child can understand it. You can either serve Jesus Christ and have eternity in the kingdom of heaven, or you can serve the devil and have eternity in the kingdom of hell. Choose this day who you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for this day and we thank you for this gathering, Lord. We thank you for these saints who are here today to come and praise you and to worship you, Lord. And Lord, as this uh, demonic time of year is upon us, we ask for an increase of your protection, Lord. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you just surround us like a shield, as it says in the Psalms. Surround us as like a shield, so that even during this dark, demonic time of year, we will just know, Lord, that we are protected from all evil, not just some evil or most evil, but we are protected from all evil because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you'll just help us to be shining lights during this dark time, and not just this dark time of year, Lord, but as the world is getting darker, as we are seeing apostasy on the increase, as we are seeing anti-Semitism on the increase, Help us, Lord, to shine the light of Jesus Christ. 
Help us, Lord, to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Give us oil in our lamps, Lord, because we can't see a thing, Lord, unless we have the oil burning in our lamps. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are out there celebrating evil. We pray particularly for the children who are being deceived. We pray, Lord, that you will open their eyes and give them discernment. We pray, Lord, that you will just protect them and bring them to a knowledge of the truth. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will just continue to help us please you and to do whatever is pleasing in your eyes, Lord. Because we know, Lord, that there's so many Christians who are not pleasing you, who are out there doing the things that do not please you, Lord. But help us here at CFM Essex to be saints who are pleasing to you, Lord, to do your work and to shine the light of Jesus Christ in this dark world. But we thank you, Heavenly Father, that it's not our own light that we have to shine. Because we don't have any light, Lord. We have no righteousness. We have no goodness. But we thank you that it's his light and his righteousness and his goodness that shines through us. Help us to shine that light brighter and brighter. And Lord, help us to be good ambassadors. Help us to be good representatives of the kingdom of God. Help us to love one another as you've commanded us to, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you'll protect this church during this time, Lord. Protect the men and women of God who are part of this church, who you are raising up, Lord. We thank you for the children of this church, Lord, and that they are being brought up in the ways of the Lord, that they are receiving the education of the word of God, and that they are being told what is evil and what is good. And we pray for more children to be brought up and educated in that way, to not be deceived and led by a bad spirit. We thank you, Lord, that tonight we are together as one body who loves you, and help us to carry out your work more effectively, Lord. We do give you thanks for this gathering and for this day and for this church service, Lord. We give you praise and thanks above all for Jesus, who shed his blood to make us righteous, to bring us into a right relationship with our creator, because without Jesus, we would be doomed to an eternal destruction, which we deserve. But we thank you, Lord, that you've not given us what we deserve. You've given us what we don't deserve, which is righteousness and eternal life. And we thank you that it's only made possible because of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We give all praise and thanks to Jesus Christ. Amen.